Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Star Chat. I'm your host, David Wallace. Tonight, I thought I'd do something different, and different meaning that I'm going to have an off-the-cuff, completely ad-lib conversation with my friend Lowell, and what we're going to talk about tonight are some pretty interesting things that have been in the background of my mind as Lowell's friend. So it's one thing to listen to me talk about my experience. It's totally a different thing to hear Lowell talk about his. What we're doing tonight is I'm going to reflect back just a tiny bit about my own communications that I've been having recently from Toth. And that's not Thoth. He chose his own name. It's Toth. He's T-O-E-T-H is how it's pronounced. Little guy that gives me information because Kim Jim, my main contact, is too busy. Kim Jim sends me messages of love, but they're like two-second sound bites. When we receive messages from our friends, whether that's inner earth or from outer earth, We'd like to be able to have the luxury of the time to understand that we've received a message in the first place. And then our soul and our, our, our mind will absorb the message, process it, and release it for all of you so that we can share what we're learning. Seven or eight days ago, Lowell was uh, contacted by myself that one of the programs that I had been put on in 20... 20 by L, the emissary from Andromeda, deposited a sound bite on my phone, let me take his pictures. He was helping me with my midterms, and the the download uh, opened up. And so we channeled it. And a friend of mine who lives in Europe, who is also a direct contactee, which I call just Star Family, because we're not contactee, we're Star Family, he was reached out. L also communicated with him and he put together a beautiful, beautiful short video. It's six minutes long of L's contact to me. And it's a message for all of humanity. And it's a message of hope and joy. But it's also something that I like everyone to think about and to remember to cyclic, cyclically continue to work on your thoughts of a higher order and of a higher nature. Because we want to always be mindful of the impact that we have on the environment around us in this dimension while we are operating outside of the 3D box world because we are interdimensional right now. We're moving into a new dimension and I've asked my friend Lowell tonight to spend some time talking to me about different dimensions, the species, Lemurians who contact him from Talos. And I'd like Lowell to help me understand one of the dynamic issues that I've had was trying to figure out the relationship that families from other stars that I am working with and that I communicate with daily, how they've been working with the inner earth races. Now, recently, there's been a lot of uploads on social media of very quickly moving interstellar conveyance in Argentina, in Ecuador, in Mexico, these ships flying at a very high speed, flying directly into mountains. No crash, no explosion, but it's like the mountain, the edge of the mountain was an interdimensional doorway and the ships just fly into them. It's the most remarkable thing. And also there's been interstellar conveyance above active volcanoes and then going straight down into them. There's been a lot of very interesting stuff about ships flying straight into the earth. And I believe this is an example or, or a facet of the ancient relationship that my family from the stars has always had with the different families that live within inner earth. So tonight I want to welcome Lowell Johnson. I have my best friend Robin sitting on the side and I know that Robin is always welcome to bring up anything that she is channeling from my off-the-cuff conversation with Lowell. So enough about Robin and I. Lowell, what a pleasure to see you again, my friend. What does this is the, a, a different hat to wear? Sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, what I want to express was uh, uh, express, and I want you to be able to take the floor and sort of say welcome because I wanted to interview you to understand a little bit more or a lot more about the the complexity of the relationship between my star families and other people's star families and other other sky nations and how they've been involved with inner earth 
And what sort of information have you been able to channel or have been spoken to about by your people? If you could get on that right away, then that's kind of my driving question. And the rest of it, I thought we'd just shoot the shit and have a great time and talk about what's going on because you're activating at a much, much higher level right now. And the stuff is just coming off of you that is so full of pure joy and bright light. And I wanted to congratulate you about that too, because you've had some wonderful manifestations from the thoughts that you manifested are now becoming reality and now are reality because thoughts are things. So enough. Go ahead, Lowell. Welcome to Star Chat. Go ahead and uh, be yourself. Thanks. I feel like I've always been here, but not sitting in this chair, you know what I mean? And it's been quite a while since I've actually had somebody interview me. Not that that means anything, but since all of those took place, and it's been a while, like I said, a lot of things have really come into focus. It's not surprising that we have this curiosity about connections between your star families off Terra and inner Earth. It wasn't that long ago that those dots really connected for me. I understood long ago that before Earth was what Earth is now, this life-sustaining, you know, a sphere here. Um, it was always an interstellar kind of, you know, place, that, a stopover, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, there was lots of interdimensional traffic that had stopped here for refilling resources and on its way. And through a series of circumstances that happened in our solar system, Earth ended up becoming um, the... Uh, life-sustaining humanity experiment that, you know, we're in the middle of living in. Um, so the fact that there have been craft coming in and out of the Earth orb for a while made my peace with that long ago. I get that. Um, so when I started to visit Shasta and started to see um, the lenticular clouds that you know, we've been explained when you see them yourself outside of a photograph, you see them in different forms. And uh, the more I researched it, the more I looked at them. And when you see them out from where they are, you get a perspective on what they really are. When you have one foot in the next dimension, you also understand what's in the ethers out there that other people really can't conceive of yet but it's there nonetheless shrouded however you want to see that the fact that we're beginning to see these ethers now is just more evidence that the veil is being you know pulled back that the things that have been hidden from our view and our wherewithal and our awareness uh, all that stuff is like getting pulled into our radar at a really rapid rate so let me go back to where the dots connected for me Dave and I, our paths didn't connect by coincidence. His connections to things off planet and his experience and the time it took for him to assimilate and be ready to talk about it um, was almost on a parallel with mine. Because I think Dave started in like 2017, wasn't it? And yeah, 2016, it was 2016 was really where things started for me. Well, no, wait a I, second. It was it was 2016 when the teal orb showed up over my car and my son pointed out that's when the whole thing started. So for 2016, 2017 is after the manifestations and the, and the mantra until they came and collected me. And that was some months until it became January of 2017. So we both had a awakening on, in the same year. Well, it, it still took to, I, for me, uh, tell us was I want to nurture my uh, uh, reconnection to you know my Lemurian roots and uh, how they spawn to Atlantis and all the things in between in Egypt and you know it, we don't have enough program time to go through all that history today. However, what it's leading me to is that when you first crossed my path and it was clear that we were going to teach each other how to vibrate in our communities, 
I was still focused on enhancing my connection to the Lemurians and a greater awareness of inner earth and the cities and the species that are there. I thought that was kind of my obligation to help bring more attention to that realm. Here comes Dave and opens the door for me to be able to communicate with Kim Jim and Toth and some of his tribe by communications of you know things that Dave received on my behalf. He was given instructions. Uh, to me, this is a famous story because here's where the two worlds collided for me. When Dave told me that he was sent um, a message intended for me from Kim Jim on where to look my, you know, where to place my focus in the sky, um, that they had messages that were waiting for me too. I never in a million years thought that that bridge was going to be involving me off with off world species. Every time Dave would tell us another instance of his occurrences with them, you know, it's thrilling to me that those things are taking place. And I always kind of, that was Dave's realm and that's his lane. So he's going to keep us in touch with that until you open the door for me to do that. Now, um, I'm in a position where I can begin to communicate with them as well. And so we can see that there's a different kind of bridge that's being created now. That not only I have connections to inner earth, I've opened the door for Dave to start to understand the Lemurian realms and the other inner earth places that are starting to make themselves known to us. Dave, on the other hand, has opened the door up to the vast number of connections that I know he's already has as an ambassador. And I dare say, based on his experiences before with new friends that have come along in forums that he didn't recognize, that we're nowhere near the end of that happening. Because just like we're curious about what's coming at us, they're curious about what's here. There's no question that we're going to have more interactions with higher dimensional beings in whatever form that is. And so let's part of our at, let's go let's, ahead. Let's look at that form. Uh, lenticular clouds. Let's just digress for a moment. Are fascinating. Some people see them as shrouds. I've always known that something was in those because they're just a little weird. Um, lenticular clouds are fabulous they look like flying saucers you know they have that classic shape they're giant because they are obfuscating motherships but not on purpose for our own enjoyment what that is is that is the way they appear interdimensionally because they know there are other dimensions that are waking up not just ours there are other I... species that exist that oh, are waking yes. up, and they also communicate with our sky families and they also communicate with the inner earth beings and so the the great lenticular cloud ships that come in are aware that other species see them interdimensionally as they wake up as well and so absolutely lowell i agree with you 100 percent. we are in the crossroad of manifestation since 2011 we were given the message from the sky that all of the things that we could ever hope or want as long as we're good and loving and forgiving and kind people will be granted to us and this began in 2011 with the great uh shift into aquarius and now that we're smack dead on in the entrance at the very beginning of the dawn of aquarius we are receiving so many gifts by creating joy and by vibrating to those uh, developmental energy fields so yeah, lenticular clouds are a great way to let us know that they're here and you can receive messages. And, you know, I do check things out on social media occasionally to see if there's any new buzz about interstellar conveyance. And I've seen some lovely stuff that's been put up in the last six months of giant ships being seen in the lenticular cloud when there's a lightning bolt or a thunderbolt that goes through it and the cloud flashes and you can see the geometric shape of the ship. It's absolutely wonderful, but they also look interdimensional. You only see aspects of their geometry in the cloud because they are trans-dimensional. 
And so we are becoming more transdimensional as we go forward. Our very beings are changing. Our soul is becoming more alive and our carbon body becomes less important. And so we're aware of this new creative us and this new spiritual us that's alive. And so, yeah, absolutely. When, when the ships are going into inner earth, what do you think their, their business is? Because I've asked the question of Toth, but he hasn't come back with an answer. And I know that the species of inner earth and the species from other galaxies are working together. What's your intuition about what they're doing? Oh, there's uh, just, we think that as star seeds, we're the only Pleiadians on the planet or the Syrians or the Orions. Um, but those are the species that are coming here to exchange technologies. And really everybody's got skin in the game in Earth's consciousness. All of those species, the Pleiadians have a vested interest. I was one of the you know scientists that came here originally in my mind to help build out the mantle in the first place. And the Syrians and then the Lyrans and everyone else that followed. Everybody has an interest in seeing Earth get to her next level. And the interactions that they're coming benevolently as they are, as they always have, is to stop us from damaging the planet in ways that um, we've just been irresponsible. We've forgotten what our connection to Guy is and what we really gained from that relationship with her. Um, and we've gotten ourselves into this mess. We're this far from repeating the lessons that we didn't learn in Atlantis all over again with the development of all this nuclear um, weaponry. Um, we didn't learn that that technology was meant to you know, benefit humanity, not destroy pieces of the planet. And so in my mind, clearly, in the 40s, when we started to develop the atomic bomb, and then dropped it on a, uh, a, a, another country. That's when we showed the rest of them what we were about to do to the earth in these carbon bodies with these short life forms. We did damage to a planet that wasn't ours. It well, like the entire I, universe. Well, absolutely. Like I mentioned, when the powerful resonant wave from the bomb went off, uh, they went, uh-oh, they found the matches. And so that's why the circumspect was drawn the attention of our sky families and the holy people from the sky turned towards Earth once again because this- Yeah, interaction with humanity was no longer forbidden. Yeah, right. They were coming right. to the rescue. And that's why people like me who understand our past lives and our ability to reincarnate, I was a Lemurian and I came back to be on this side of the incarnation so that my energy would go toward <clears throat> assimilating inner earth and the surface when the time came, when the vibration was right. I'm here because that was going to happen within my lifetime. And here we are. Every sign that we see just points as evidence toward all of this. And I just want <clears throat> to back up the truck for a moment on lenticular clouds when I really understood them for what they were, happened to be one night when I was home in Santa Rosa. And there's really no mountains in that area. There's some hilly areas. But regardless, I went out one night at the end of May before I was getting ready to return to Shasta and looked at the full moon that night from the balcony of my kid's townhouse. And off in a distance, over to the left, I saw a craft that looked like a three-stage lenticular cloud. I watched it for about 10 minutes, went in the house, and when I came out later, this form had now like separated, almost like a craft was separating itself from something else. Later that evening, there would be news reports of these things along California that had sprouted all along places that got people's attention. 
well, they're not lenticular clouds because there was no mountains by the way that we understood the definition. We know that these things are starting to happen and there's curiosity from those other beings that are here. Earth's vibration at the same time has already risen to experience things in that realm. We're straddling. All of us, that are, our sentient beings are tied to our vibrations and Earth's halfway there. She's got one foot in the fourth dimension and that's why we can begin to see these things that we never saw before and didn't pay attention to. All of these conditions are changing now so that we do. And so uh, to kind of bring this full circle, to be able to kind of be in the middle of connecting Dave's beyond earth sentient family to the inner earth family. Here's why we're here. Wow. That's, um, that's great, Lowell. Um, and that certainly adds some clarity to it in your communications with, um, the people of inner earth or the species of inner earth. Have you had presence of mind to send them a message about any curiosity you may have had about star nations, star families? Have you had any kind of conversation with inner earth beings about what's going on from the holy people that come from the sky? No, honestly, I haven't. Uh, but it had my awareness of these two separate worlds in my mind really didn't come to pass until, would you say, really the last two weeks? I'll tell you when it really triggered. It was the night after your podcast a couple of Thursdays ago when the Saturday before those instructions I was referring to that you received from Kim Jim to give to me, you gave me those on Saturday told me that there was going to be interactions and contact that would be made. And then Thursday after your podcast, you went outside and had something respond to you in a way that even when you recorded it on your phone, we could all tell that this thing responded to you. That is when that became more real for me. Thank you. Um, when, I get that kind of response immediately. It's because they've been training me and teaching me how to use my mind differently than other human beings. Facts are facts. I'm sorry if that sounds arrogant. I don't approach this in a cavalier manner at all. This is very important tutelage. I am their student and I am still an ambassador and I'm still going through training. As I learn how to go past and create more bridges and more avenues of open, honest communication with other human beings in order to affect that 1% turning into 100%. Very important that all of us realize that all the work that we're doing is holding up that field. Now, I know that my uh, star family and many, many other star families, including the Arcturans, including those from Cygnus or from uh, Vega, Alpha Centauri, from Andromeda, they're all working with the Earth, and they have been for many thousands of years. But I was uh, really pleased to hear you sort of talk a little bit about the impression that you get, because oftentimes, unless we have an opportunity, when we are in council with a species who is our teacher, when we are in council, we don't always get an opportunity to talk to them. Okay, everybody, I'm going to give you a little issue or a little little piece of information. I know, Lowell, that when you're in presence, because it's presence of spirit, it's like being in the Holy Spirit. When you're in presence with the Holy Spirit or when you're in presence with the being, it isn't that you're dumbfounded. It's just that you're there for a very specific reason. And they're teaching us how to sort of accept that because we don't always get a chance to say, Hey, it's really great to see you again. I have uh, questions X, Y, and Z I need answered so that I can share that with my community, with my tribe. It doesn't work that way. When you're in presence with spirit, you are overcome. And it's, it's a beautiful blessing to be near these holy, holy spirits and these holy people, the sky nations, the inner earth nations, they're all working for, all species, you see, 
So as a human being, I am training myself to not think in terms of they're doing this for me. They're doing it for all life. So what I say instead is I'm recognizing this. Me recognize that is what I'm saying. But I know that that's not just for me. There's messages for all species in other dimensions as well. So whether, you know, there's all kinds of interesting things about ghosts and spirits. Some of them may seem malevolent. Some of them may seem unhappy or some of them are friendly and they want to give us a message. Well, that's okay. They are uh, either a memory or a, a new being in an ether in another dimension. So whatever occurs, whether it's for a, a field mouse or a grasshopper, if it's for a red robin or for an elephant, it doesn't matter. Everything that the sky families do with Gaia and the species, the different species that live inside of Gaia, is for a very solemn, purposeful reason. It makes, sorry about that, it makes it really evident that the message that's coming across is not individual, but an energy field of light and love. So they train us to hold this field up. So I, I have friends. I have my friend Donna, uh, and she's holding the field up way, way out in, like, Nova Scotia. Uh, we have Chantal. She's holding the field up in Canada. Um, I have my friend who helps me with my celestial messages. He's holding the field up in the Mediterranean. You have your the, the gals and the guys in uh, Germany. I have family in Scotland and England. We're all holding the field up because as we remember, we spoke about the temples and the ley lines that uh, Vivian. Yeah, how, they're all written to, together. Absolutely. Well, so the ambassador program is a group of human beings that are connecting this and this. And as we send out a beam, a constant signal of hope, charity, love, kindness, forgiveness, and appreciation, appreciation, very, very deep appreciation of all life, because that's all we're capable of doing. But once we do that, then they reach out to us and they, they give us many, many more special lessons, special lessons of ancient history, special lessons of future history. And Lowell is recipient to this. Now, in my private exchange with you, Lowell, I've, I've heard you say some pretty amazing things, and we'll keep those private because you have a concrete awareness of the dear people who live in another world inside of these mountains. When you first um, realized that they were going to ask you to develop yourself in this incarnation into a conduit for Talos, were they also saying this is something you've done in a past life and you're repeating that process for us? Or was this a new thing for you in your soul carnation, incarnation? <laughs> in this incarnation, it was new. But I clearly had a different role previously in Lemuria that was more priest-like, more, you know, like I'd had... Um, a history of Melchizedek teachings where I understood that the universe is bound by light. And that's our responsibility is to perpetuate that. So, you know, part of my responsibility being here with that in mind is to um, make people aware of what light is. Because there's a couple of different aspects of light to consider. One is the light that we hold this spark of source that's in our soul to begin with, we're just riding around in this carbon body. But when this is done, that spark of source through this incarnation had lots of new lessons that we learned and we contributed back to the collective. But there's also some more physical, metaphysical, electromagnetic light that's coming from solar sources that is new to us. When Dave was explaining the nature of how we find ourselves now into you know, this part of the procession of the equinoxes, and here we are in the age of Aquarius, here we are, we're in an enhanced 
photon energy belt that's feeding all the sentient life in its path to get ready to hold higher vibrations and greater light because that's what's coming at us. The light that we've been getting from the sun that she gets from her central sun that we've been emitting with, um, it's my understanding we've been living on what's called half oriantric light. You know, when the earth vibrated the way it was, when the human residents monitored at 7.83 hertz, you know, that's kind of where we all started. But, oh, we've been vibrating way above that and spiking for some time now. Here is evidence of new light levels that we're getting. We were used to something else. We, many of us, have already been outfitted, if you want to see it in that way, cellularly with the capacity to hold greater light because we're getting full on oriantric light coming at us now. That's what's going to change us. That's what's prodding Earth's rise in consciousness is this new level of light that's coming at us that we were warned by with, from Kumu two years ago. There's a new spectrum of light coming our way. And we had to adapt in order to be able to even receive this new level. So that's, I hope that everybody embraces the idea of light. Then you can understand when you actually receive it and you hold it and it grows and it emits out of you. When people say they can see your light because your aura you know, just blasts, that's you being at a frequency to accept this new light and then without uttering a word, watch how it affects all the people around you. Because mm. every person I know in the tribe has that gift. I look at Robin and Robin doesn't have to do anything but to smile once in a while. And boy, she just lights up a room. She didn't have to do anything else. There's a vibratory level that our five senses don't serve that we have all got in touch with. And that's what we're trying to assist others to get in touch with that part of yourself. Beautiful. And then watch the magic. Right. Absolutely beautiful. Well, uh, one of the things that comes forward, and, and I know that we've spoken about this in the same in a similar term about our carbon, our carbon bodies. And I'm uh I'm careful to very uh accurately understand that term because I also see our carbon bodies as a very important connective uh, uh, conduit to this reality because we have a we have a function to serve, not to take. We have a function to renew. We have a function yes. that we physically feel. And without this carbon body, the way your soul is set up, you cannot feel the emotions of the lessons that we're all supposed to learn. Because if you want to convert your life's job, your soul job, and use the dharma of your experience, that converts to karma so that we can all take this experience from our carbon body yes. existence. Yes. And our karma is what relates and translates the human experience to source. So we yes. really don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not diminishing the term, our carbon shell, which we use in a hundred years. That carbon shell is very, very important because it houses all those fabulous neurons and your physicality. And that yeah. produces those, specific soul memories and those soul ideas that we take with us forever so that car well, that's really the point um this is the form that we have given this density if we want to play in earth as it is right now this is the physical form that we're in and it happens to be carbon based you know the downside it doesn't last for very long you know you're uh, you kind of rot, roll it in and out of this but right. when you get to the next level where your light form mm -hmm. There's no linear timeline associated with how long you stay in that form because it doesn't break down. Agreed. We are here Agreed. to un understand this dimension, and it was something we had to get through as a species and overcome it in spite of all the challenges and obstacles that have been thrown in our path. Right. And so what really makes sense about this carbon form diminishing after 80 or 100 years is that means that no matter how skilled we are, whatever we do to stay healthy and fit, 
we still have to realize that this carbon shell. Now, there's a specific reason that we only live this certain period of time. There are many, many schools of thought about how humans used to live 3,000 years or 500 years and Methuselah lasted 1,000 years. Okay, okay, we're not going there. What I'm going to say, though, is that short window of 100 years is compressed information. Your soul carries that information. Poof, off you go. And you translate and relate the experience to source. Source is entertained. Source <laughs> teaches you about yourself. It develops your soul for the next step. And we do. We become spirit beings. So when we develop our activities in this life, I could say, you know, it's nice having a body in this dimension because I love hiking up mountains. I might, well, as a spirit being in an orb, I would just float right up and I wouldn't break a sweat. But as an orb, I probably wouldn't sit around the campfire and suck a beer and play guitar either. So, <laughs> you know, there's real advantages to being in a carbon shell. And uh, it's great because we feel, we feel all these wonderful things. Remember, folks, it's a wonderful natural experience to have emotions. We're lucky to have them if we understand them and, and are at peace with them. Do uh, you have a special series of thoughts meditation, ritual, uh, ablutions, prayer, yoga, meditation to communicate with inner earth? Is there a key that, that is helpful for you that opens you up and allows you to conduit and channel the information and the love from them? Just like I've explained many of the different systems that I use to communicate with my star family that's helpful and easy for other people. It takes a while to learn, but once you master this, then when you master control of your own mind and your own consciousness, everything becomes super, super simple. And you don't you don't worry about stuff anymore. So maybe you can explain to me a little bit about the conditions you create for yourself in order to become a conduit and become one with inner earth. You know, we have had lots of discussions recently about the importance of meditation. And so we're going to kind of go back to this so that you can understand my perspective on how it affected me. When meditation at first is clunky and awkward and um, not very uh, reliable. It can be. It Why, can be for many people. At first, when you're just getting used to it, you can achieve those periods where you can get to that sense of quiet and peace and really find yourself at the door of probabilities. Here you are. But when you're just start getting started out, that is not a regular occurrence. It takes practice to that for you to achieve that level on a regular basis. It took me months. Now, I say that, and I heard people say this when I was starting out, too, and I kept telling myself, well, I won't take that long. <laughs> I'll tell you now in retrospect, it absolutely takes that long for it to become part of who you are. And once it is, once that meditative state, my habit in the morning, um, and I used to have a more um, a refined yoga practice as well. Um, I'm just not in a position to be able to do that regularly, but I still start out every morning. And as soon as I wake up, the first 20 minutes are dedicated to the getting in that meditative state. And now I hold that throughout my day. No matter what noise comes around, whatever white noise is around me, I've already found that state. But it took me years to live in that condition now. When you're in that condition, reaching out to higher aspects of yourself and consequently, higher things from other realms, piece of cake now. You're just kind of permanently connected on that frequency, and you decide whether you want to pay attention to it or not. The trouble is, it's so wonderful that when you do focus on it, you don't want to come back to this noise. Uh, and right now, uh, uh, we all get that, We brother. still have a balancing act. Right? It's like, you know... I'm 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 not a I'm not afraid to admit that I, I I do touch upon the devil's lettuce every once in a while, and I sure enjoy it because you know uh, God's great green gift is so good. I get a little tiny bit of rheumatoid arthritis, and 
if uh to be quite honest if i want to sit down with my friends up at the mountains we'll play some uh some some poker at the table at 10 p.m we like to uh, have a little devil's lettuce and i i think that's one of the greatest gifts of of our corporeal form right now too just to sort of have a blast so much nicer than a cigarette or a pipe um so there's plant, there's purpose to that plant medicine. Oh, I'm telling you, tell me people about that it. think that they just it's use a, that to get high. Oh no no no! It's used like used in the proper ceremonial circumstances. You'll connect to things beyond yourself and open yourself up to thoughts sure. you did not have before. Um, I, being the Capricorn, was totally in sync with my logic side. I'll tell you what, mother marijuana has done for me many times is it cracks open the creative side i'm no artist but you've seen what kind of ar things that have come through me guys that is divine stuff and oh, yeah. you no, can't do that without both does. sides coming together yeah it absolutely does it, it joins the two hemispheres in a much more harmonious way so that your mind is more in sync it allows you to access those creative centers. But, you know, you're creative when you're logical too, Lowell, and you are a logical guy. So transcendental meditation, because I've heard you talk about TM, and I know you and I are both children of the 60s, and we were affected by transcendental meditation studies that came from many different sources, some from some great masters. Some people received it through uh, Swami Yogananda from the Beatles, some of them got it from uh, listening to George Harrison and Ravi Shankar work together. And we learned about Vedic texts through Indian music. I know I did. That was my pathway. But so transcendental meditation is one form of powerful meditation that does take a while. And when you meditate, remember that you must never pretend to have mastery over this because meditation is just the entrance the meditation is the entrance. And so what you work on is entering into a state. And then once you achieve this specific state, because of this specific school of thought or meditation that you've been trained in or that you have practiced and studied for many years, then you are able to have this wonderful oneness with the universe, clarity of thought. Were you doing transcendental meditation as an active part of your life when you had this amazing um relation begin when the doors were wide open for you and you walked into the mountain in shasta how, yeah. how many years i was you about been practicing transcendental about, meditation before this about two years wow two so years. It was finally it was like you were yes. doing tm and then right yes. after two years they said wow this guy's got some tm going on let's let almost like it was by design huh Totally. I mean, Here, well, we're going to wake you up so you recognize what we're going to show you. That's really what happened. I, I tried many different aspects of trying to get to meditation. It was suggested as a remedy, uh, a, a therapeutic remedy after the TIA. And so while I was going to lay on the couch for 30 days, here's an opportunity for me to research what I could. And after a couple of weeks, I was frustrated by the process. Because whatever this mantra they kept talking about was, I didn't know where to get one. You certainly couldn't find one on eBay, and they didn't have it on Amazon. Um, but eventually, I came back around to watching The Secret again for, you know, however I was prodded to do that, and then remembered by the course of watching that, that were, there are professionals there who have been involved in TM and the scientific research behind it and um, its history. And uh, I thought, let's try it. I've tried everything else. This four day process, that's the same process for everybody. If it's that simple, I want to give it a try. Well, Wonderful. by the second day, I recognize differences. By the third day, I thought I saw my path becoming a TM trainer. That's really where I thought I was going to. I had such wonderful benefits after three days, peace of mind, and stress balls that was gone from my system that I had no clue that was there. <clears throat> this is what I thought other people needed to know. Because if I could achieve this level of really wonderful health, that's what it felt like. Everybody needs to know this. 
Well, I'm going to just stop you right there because I know that our community is got to take a little breath. So let's just go. Yeah. Take a little breath and say, wow, Lowell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a, a beautiful expression of your understanding of this because transcendentalism and the deep solemnity that comes with being at peace with the world and the universe that we reside in is something that my friend Robin Rice is very good at. And if, if there's any testament of a soul in this conversation of someone who loves you and I, Robin, you've been so quiet and lovely and contemplative. And uh, I just want you to step in for one or two minutes and add your love and add your voice, because this is about Lowell and supporting Lowell and to get to know Lowell a little bit better and to ask him some some honest questions because this isn't scripted and so if you have any honest questions you want to share with lowell uh, to to either support him or to get to know him better why don't you go ahead and, and ask one or two of those questions i don't have any questions of lowell you know i really don't have any questions that come to mind but you know lowell you know, knows how much robin I and i have him. been on this path together for a while now we have been you know it's it's um funny how we come together you know and things just um I, i'm here and meant to be you know they're 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 meant to to cross paths join paths you know walk the same path whatever you want to call it um but um can i tell yeah. them how together this really is <laughs> i'll tell you the first time outside of shasta that rob and i connected was when I made the decision I was going to start to talk about these things publicly, I chose a venue in Vegas and it was kind of during COVID. So it got a little messy, but in the end, Robin was one of the people who came and participated. It wouldn't be until later in the day that when we found out in a hotel that had what, 300 rooms it was a red rock resort. Her room was right across the hallway from mine. Wow. Fantastic. Okay, so that's great because, you know, you and Robin are definitely connected in that way. I myself have millions of questions, so you'll have to forgive me. I don't have that that wonderful, just easygoing connection. I love Lowell very dearly, but there's still things about him that I'm finding out as his friend. And so I'm going to ask questions. And uh, one of the other questions that was sort of gnawing at the back of my mind was, what was your latest message? from the energies and from the divine source of talos there in arizona for you what can you share what they've shared with you over the last couple of days verbatim so because i yes. have a friend, i don't know i mean do lemurians translate into english or do you just want to do what yaya does because well that's the the answer to your question lies in that statement in right. that the hustle right now for us is to help people understand how to communicate at a vibratory level. <clears throat> they speak in vibration. And that's what, since last year, they had made clear that it's time for humanity to understand this mode of communication. It's time for you to understand vibration. And so that's what the push is going to be, to open yourself up quiet yourself so you can communicate at that level and then wait to see what's revealed when you listen to yaya because she's remarkable she has a very very beautiful sense of ancient wisdom and she carries herself very givingly because yaya my psychic intuition tells me that she's a very giving person um when you understand yaya the way you do does her evocation bring into mind any specific images for you? Because I, I'm going to make a comparison to what I see with Yeya and somebody else that I know. So do you do you do you draw in any specific images as she channels her channeling? Because I know she has a message for everyone, and you've given her a beautiful platform and many opportunities to be free with the tribe. And she's such a special person. Do you see something when she speaks? Do you feel or see? I get, yeah, I get visions of wh who I think she's channeling. What 
it took me a while to get used to was when she gets into one of her transmissions, there will be multiple beings that are communicating and you'll sense the difference in the cadence or um, the, the, the kind of the I, symbolic, you know, tones that are coming out. That's how you distinguish between them. And after a while, because I pay attention to that kind of little <laughs> minutia, when it seemed like they were different, I just saw a different higher aspect of whoever she was channeling come through. Over the time that I've had communication with her, if I was to characterize her, um, Yaya is like half oracle and half cosmic conduit. She has the ability to connect to aspects meant for you beyond yourself that want to communicate through her with messages for you. Some of those are meant for all of us. And those are the ones that we push out there. Some of them are meant for just us. And, you know, at first I wanted to share everything. It wouldn't be until later that I would understand really the sacredness of that communication I was getting from my higher aspects and others that were here benevolently to assist humanity. Um, it took me a while to put all that in perspective, like everything else that's been going on. It's been all extraordinary. But when you really let it sink in, it's just right. This is where we're going. This is who we're supposed to be. And you know, when I see myself sending everyone I'm connected to, love and light, no matter where they are and no matter what their thought form happens to be today, I chalk that up as that's your journey you chose. Somehow in your soul contract, this is what you agreed to do. And here are the lessons you're learning. I have no comprehension of what those are. So how am I and why should I communicate about you? I have my own set of circumstances here. I got my hands full of living this life right here. And so judging isn't my thing. I don't like to get it. So I don't want to offer it. In the meantime, when we understand that that poor soul going through the lessons that they're going through, when they reach their next level, they're taking those Akashic lessons that they just learned through this incarnation and contributing them to all of our benefit. The collective, like I've said before, benefits from all the lessons we've all learned so that we don't individually have to learn some of all the crappy things we've got. Yeah, the good news in the long abs run. Right. Absolutely spot on. We, we're uh, done with 3D lessons. We're well, we, we spoke. And absolutely, we are done with 3D lessons because we're not in that field anymore. We're done with it. And yes. we're working on other lessons and other new discoveries. This isn't just, for me, it's like not just a lesson. It's a discovery. It's almost like sculptural light. It's like light that comes to our minds that takes many different forms and shows us what we will become. And it's a beautiful play tool. Everyone had Play-Doh when we were kids. Well, we have the sculptural light that enters our minds. Now, when I listen to Yaya, I love what she does, and I love the sound of her voice, and I know that she's receiving many messages, but it, it's not as clear for me. Because remember that when people channel or when they when they are speaking a star language, many of them call star languages, um, it doesn't always have to resonate for everybody. So when you introduce Yaya, I wasn't resonating on that on the same level you were because she brings in a different uh, being. She brings in a different energy, just like everyone else does. But, you know, this is why we had Chantal on. For me, when I listen to Chantal, do you know what I see? I don't see any ethereal being. What I see are dolphins swimming around in outer space in beautiful colored space. When she speaks, I see divine feminine aspect. I see mermaid people that go from the ocean to outer space. And I see dolphin and tropical fish in space. It's unreal. So I listen to what she says. And those are the images and the light sculpture that her, her beautiful um, benevolent being speaks to her in. 
And so when she speaks, and I've never discussed that with Chantal, I'm just telling you. So it's like, but it's really bitching. I mean, when she talks, that's what I feel. Now, when I when I'm up in the Sequoias, when I'm up in Belknap, when I'm up in Mount Rainier, uh, I've never seen a Yeti. I've never seen a Bigfoot or a Yeti or Sasquatch. I know they're there, and I know how to be respectful to them if they ever show up and how to take care of them if they ever need it. I know these these gifts, but I know that if I ever meet one, it'll all be good because they're so connected too. And so they have their own language that they speak. And you can hear recordings of Yeti and Sasquatch yelling in the forest. And this is their message. And so they're channeling as well. It's almost like when a lion roars or an elephant makes that beautiful rumble or a Tibetan monk does throat singing. We're all drawing down the divine ether and speaking through that. So I really like the fact that Yaya works with you and you've worked with her and you have that understanding relationship. Because I support that, and I support that interesting relationship with my love and my energy field 100%. She's a fascinating person, and I'd like to see you bring her back on the show and maybe talk to her a little bit about her soul feelings about her karmic responsibility to this dimension. So dimensionality is so important. Does anybody in Inner Earth speak to you about your responsibility or your role while you still have one foot in this dimension? Oh, yes. Yeah, I know what it is. I, I, yeah. There was a, a place um, on the planet where the original 12 crystal temples that were set here uh, and spaced accordingly to set the grid, this Think of this as an electromagnetic grid. Um, yeah. Over time, the, the, those temples became out of alignment. And what's happening now is all of those things are being placed back in alignment. So when Earth is ready for that last surge of electromagnetic up, this originally um, when the planet was first seeded, there were priests and priestesses that began with Lemurian um, temples first. And I was given responsibility over one of those long ago. It happened to be located beneath Lake Titicaca. This inner earth city is still in that location. But the unique part of it is that it was part of the Lemurian landmass that bordered an Atlantean landmass back then. And this area was just thriving. Can it I was just, really can the, I just, the I lines have between for... Atlantean and Lemurian. Yes. I have to stop you. I have to stop you for two seconds. We've had someone join on, which is terrific. It says Zoom user. If you guys could please mute because the sound interactions coming from your device are actually causing a, a replicative fade in the signal. And we're trying to listen to Lowell talk about Lemuria. Just welcome. Thank you for joining Star Chat, but just go ahead and mute your device. Thank you. Lowell, go ahead. You were talking about pretty sure it's Nate. But regardless, anyway. Um Yes, These it's me. Two. Hi, guys. Sorry. My, I, I've been <laughs> muted, though. I've, I've been muted. I'm, I've been no, muted. Not, Just necessary, not necessary to apologize. It's okay. okay. Welcome. We'll get back to you. Um, anyway, the the interactions between those two cultures was just, it, it was like a flow. It was beautiful. Here was a model of unity and compassion and connection to all Everybody got along. It wasn't like, you know, on one hand, the poor Atlanteans get a bad rap because, yeah, they were driving the bus when things went south and land masses resulted in, you know, destroying, being destroyed as a result of those actions. But not all of the Atlanteans were that way. Some of the technologies they had was pretty incredible, given what they did, limited to fifth dimensional abilities and technologies. 
Now, <laughs> what the Lemurians had originally, though, however, was seventh dimensional awareness of technologies and that type of environment. And that's what the Atlanteans always wanted. They wanted that. Well, there were reasons why they were never going to achieve that. It's just beyond, just like we have trouble really comprehending where the fifth dimension is going to be. Oh, we got some wonderful ideas from our co-creating sides about what that will be. But we're still in three dimension right now. And so we're trying to understand things beyond our capacities. So you kind of understand the nature of what Atlantis and Lemuria were kind of compared with. Um, Atlantis just had a different agenda at the time. But uh, we're getting back to a place where Earth hasn't been to this level of consciousness before. It, it could be argued that maybe there were humans that had reached fifth dimensional awareness before. I don't know if you can consider that maybe the Atlanteans were they human yeah, and they achieved fifth dimensional awareness. So if that's a perspective we want to look at things from, Earth, however, was still in her third dimensional form. She couldn't push past all that. But now she's vibrating at a higher level. And that density that we're in right now is going to, it no longer exists. Earth's new form doesn't support that density anymore. And so we're all kind of, by nature, forced to rise our own vibrations. That's why we talk about staying in alignment, right? keeping your vibration high, because when the day of the Earth's consciousness comes, you're not going to get a warning. It's just going to be upon us. And we can only hope that we've done what we could to help prepare you just to a level of awareness that it's possible it's going to happen. We know it's a certainty, but the majority of people still walking around too busy to focus on the things that we've been holding space for. Um, I hope for the best. Yes, but indeed. They're still we, going to make their own choices. Yes, indeed. We, we do hope for the best, and that's part of what I was saying about holding our field up. Let's um, look uh, a little, a few minutes ago, you were discussing that dimensionality, the technology of the fifth dimension up to the, uh, uh, the Atlanteans wanting to have some technology from the seventh dimension. So dimensionality can be viewed many ways, spheres within spheres, traveling from one bubble to the next outwardly. It can be inwardly. It could be layers this way so that you can look trans-dimensionally, you can see a long, long, eternally long image of many trillions and trillions and trillions of universes. There should be no cap on dimensionality because there is no true understanding of the origin or the size of our universe. And we shouldn't be looking at the minutia to try and discover how big it is, how wide it is, or how old it is. That's all ridiculous. You have to accept the creator's wisdom and live within the universal law. Now, Transdimensional, transdimensionalism, and transdimensional existence. These are all things that they're proving to us now that we understand the physicality of dimensionality. <laughs> that if you want, you can indeed you can take your corporeal form to the fourth dimension. I know that I can because I've been on interstellar conveyance and gone to Brokali, 65 light years away from Earth. So, and we got there in about four hours. <laughs> so do the maths. Who knows how it happened? Probably a wormhole, inter or trans-dimensionally. So the technology that Atlanti uh, the Atlanteans eventually sort of ran amok with, there's only a certain period of time when technology no longer matters. And so when Lowell's talking about technology of the seventh dimension, I'm pretty sure... What we're looking at is a form of technology which is trans-dimensional, which means that it can work in the fourth, it can work in the third, it can work in the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh. Once you pass past a certain other special, evolutionary, ancient, ancient tunnel of existence beyond, then there are other forms of technology because all species adapt their existence even if your spirit to have some form or mode or mechanism because thoughts 
our technology. Thoughts are things. They are real. I uh, and I and stop you there just for a moment because you just hit on something that as I was doing research for the book, I went back to listen to a lot of the things that have crossed my path. And there was a young Indian young man, Sam the Illusionist, who, among other things, um, channels the Lemurians. And during one of those channelings, he um, was bringing some questions that this Australian filmmaker, Adam Rickus, had heard about my story. And he knew that Sam could channel the Lemurians. So Adam traveled to India to have this conversation with Sam. He said, I've heard that the Lemurians are in Mount Shasta. Can you validate these things? Well, he went into his channel and he began to talk about the things and questions that Adam had. Adam wanted to understand um, what their technology was like. And their answer was this, that we think of numbers on a screen in terms of money as you know how we value things. They value things based on their consciousness and their technology is driven by their consciousness because without consciousness, you can't have technology. Right. So thread that together right. and now right. you understand the nature of who they are and what they can do. Right. Because light becomes a solid object and the thought of light can be used as a tool. It can be used as a ship or a mode of conveyance you can fly within the light of your mind to another world. This is You understand how to manipulate prima matra, creation material. Right. You understand the building blocks of what you can do with that in the next dimension and how you want to create your next environment. Because you're not limited like we are here to manifesting things on this really awkward stage in third dimension. Yeah, they don't have these awkward steps where we're going, and there's no delay to what we want to manifest. So imagine, with all the wonderful things we've learned so far, how accelerated our co-creating is going to be when we get to the next level. Absolutely. That's um, bang on. When we manifest the concept of prima matra, and we understand that you can draw physical material from other dimensions and deposit them here in this dimension. I remember many, many years ago seeing a Sufi put his hand into a small clay pot that maybe would hold two gallons of water, and he turned his hand. And after some time, maybe five, ten minutes, ash would start coming out of the pot. And he would sit there in meditation and spin his hand inside of an empty clay jug and over a period of two or three hours, there would be 15 to 25 pounds of ash um, that he manifested in this prima matra. And this is your ability to transcend the borders and the boundaries of dimensionality, which have been forced upon you. Remember, everybody, that your soul that is existing within your corporeal form is meant to work in this life as an intellectual and emotional conduit so that you can share the experience of the bliss of life and share the experience of the bliss of knowing. Not one tree, pool of water, stone, uh, or star in the night sky is without a soul. All of this is connected. And so we can look back almost, and if you just open up your mind's eye and you open up your heart, you'll hear ancient stories. And they will come forward to you. You'll hear ancient stories of brave people ancient stories of existence beyond what you could ever imagine. You just have to open yourself to it. Lowell is a living example of the ability to accept that which he was told never existed. I myself am as well, and we bring you our story of truth. Lowell's story is true, and it comes from Lowell. It doesn't come from other people. He speaks the truth. I hear Lowell's words, and they're very truthful, and I hear them both in my heart and in my mind. And when Lowell speaks of Lemuria, I start to see these beautiful underground caverns and these beautiful limpid pools and the beautiful light. It's almost like a sun that exists within their own realm. And I know that Lowell will help me go to Lemuria and help me prepare to be entranced into the mountain 
And this is something that I'm looking forward to because Lowell and I will be working together in the near future. I want everyone to go on 40,000 foot view and have a look at what's going on in the manifestations of Lowell's life. Lowell, would you like to talk for a few minutes about uh, how your thoughts have manifested or you just want to announce that? (laughs) Yeah, it's been quite the dump over the last three days. You know, it, Until really Dave came along and I had a chance to reflect back on some things that had happened really since the time that we first saw one another in Shasta. Now I can understand where we're going and where none of us, especially you and I, you know, we dipped our toe into, you know, the conference realm and, you know, thought that we were amongst other people who thought the same way, felt the same way, communicated the same way, uh, only to learn that they weren't. And so that's okay. We just withdrew from that. Well, that was a good and a bad thing. Uh, It was a good thing because over this time, we've had the chance to really discern a little bit more and to come to terms with what it is without other touchstones helping us along the way to understand what we really are holding and what it's meant for, because it wasn't meant for just us. We were sent here to be examples of what people can do because we're no different in human form. The only difference is my level of awareness. But if I got there, so can you. So, um, when it came clear that we were no longer supposed to sit on the sidelines, that we weren't going to jump into the conferences again, um, I'd heard James Gillen a few different times talk about his experiences, and they're kind of parallel to Dave's and mine. In fact, it was uh, I, we were listening to a podcast Dave had sent to me with one of his friends that you know he had been kind of along this journey for a while. And they were exchanging, you know, things that were going on. And James was talking about how he got into the conferences and then just said, screw it, had enough of that and decided to do things on his own. Well, that kind of leads us to where we're going next. When Dave and I decided that we would be willing to do um, some more of this publicly, that we were going to do it under more controlled circumstances. We weren't going to host conferences, but we were interested in intimate opportunities so that when people wanted to engage with us in real time, that we could figure out a way to do that. So what we came up with between these energetic areas, because to, to both of us, it would benefit all of us if we can take you to the same places that triggered and validated and activated us. We want to show you what these areas are, but these aren't meant for everybody. There is a level of um, awareness that you need to achieve that high vibration or it's going to be a waste of your time and a waste of our time. So when we decided we would do these things in person, we found a really wonderful formula. Um, When I saw this plot in Sedona that, let's just say, it's on top of some incredibly energetic space to begin with, like on the top of a former Lemurian temple, the way that this campus is laid out, it's got two five-bedroom homes. Well, within this space, Five individuals can have this house. The experiencer takes one of the rooms and all the other rooms have private space. You got your own room. So if you want a double occupancy up, you can. So the reality is that Dave in that house has maybe eight people, four to eight. I in the other house have the same. So we can do some really quality time things with people from a Monday to a Friday, get you out where you can have your own experiences. We're not here to teach you meditation. You're beyond that. You're beyond connecting to something else, but you've just reached a plateau and you want something else that's going to activate you to the next level. I've heard that people have had conversations and communications with inner earth beings. I want that. 
I've heard people have had communications and contact with beyond Earth sentience. I want that. That's what we're here to offer next. So well, the small keeping, groups are going to do that. Right. And then for right. the newbies, we found some spaces that once a month we'll do a seminar for 100 people. And in the morning, we'll share crazy stories and pictures. And then the afternoon, it'll be Abraham Hicksish. Here's a microphone. Come and ask us anything you want to ask us. Absolutely. We're, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that whole aspect of the mystery school that's coming up, but not at this very moment. One of the things that I would like to add is whether you are uh, in mastery in a uh, higher form of yourself that you weren't several years ago, and you have a higher understanding of seeing everything that's going on around you, not being negatively affected by it and yet able to produce very strong, powerful programs of love and change for the help and the hope of Gaia and all of humanity. If you're at that level, you want to stay in touch with us because I am going to offer things that will allow you to make decisions on whether or not you want to follow through. You're going to already have the gifts and the tools. And this is the thing about a, a, a mystery school or a, a mastery class is that when you sit down, oh, yes, there are many times when a newbie, as you call them, have taught me many deep lessons about myself and stayed with me for many, many years as an associate and a friend, whether that's a scientist or whether that is somebody that is going to, uh, whether that's a scientist or somebody who's going to want to learn what I know about BES. But what I'll offer is an opportunity for other human beings to understand the program that I use. We've had some beautiful souls that have come on to Lowell's tribe community comment section who said, perhaps I'm not ready or I'm afraid to contact them. And you have very sacred, special reasons why. And so I'm not the kind of person who believes that everyone should speak to beyond the sentience. But if you're a person who sees ships regularly, has an intuition that you're being spoken to would like a little bit more clarity so that you can start having full-time conversations, then yes, please get in touch with me and get in touch with Lowell and we'll sit down and we will make available the tools that work for us. Now, th that's not a guarantee, but we have some very major successes, as you can see in the, both the video footage, cameras, experience. I mean, so we're not going to say, oh yeah, we're going to teach you how to get in a ride on a UFO and go to another planet. That's not what it's about. It's about helping you really, really come to a deeper feeling and understanding about your own abilities and watching you open up and becoming that amazing extra person that you were hoping to find. Because you're going to make it anyways. We're all going to make it because we're in tribe. But let's get together and allow us to share some unique and very impactful skills. If you're interested in having this relationship with Beyond Earth Sentience who care about us, remember, we don't flash lights at them. We don't charge you $800 to freeze to death in the desert for 24 hours and shine a laser at them. We're not doing that. That's not communication. What we're going to do is empower you with the tools that are successful for us and will become successful for you with patience. And like I say, sometimes it's a week or two. Sometimes it's a year. For me, it was 11, 12 months. And then they came down and collected me. And it's the miracle of my life that I'm so happy to share. Lowell, I'd like to thank you very much for being a guest of Star Chat tonight. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? And if you want to mention the message from L. Uh, my emissary friend from Andromeda that my friend in Europe has helped me put this message together over two years and it's been sent to Lowell so that he can share it with tribe and what a beautiful group of people Lowell I'm going to let you finish our interview tonight and I just want to let you say what a what an interesting experience you've had living with me or working with me has been fun but having you in my life has been a blessing Robin <laughs> you know how I feel about you darling you're so wonderful and mm -hmm beautiful and just you're so there and zoom user thank you for staying with the show um i have a feeling i know who it is but we're not going to mention names tonight he is <laughs> zoom user so have a great <laughs> night have a great night everybody and uh lowell please just finish off our interview 
because it's been great talking to you off the cuff and unscripted. You sure find out a lot of interesting stuff. And I sure can't wait for next year because your mystery school is going to be so wonderful to be involved with. Just wonderful. Yeah. Can't wait. Can't yeah. wait. One more thing. Can't wait for Vivian to join you as well. Cause I know she's going to have oh. some gifts to share. And there are many other wonderful people who will be there to help all of us feel the same things that we feel the great joy of life, the great message from the creator and spread the joy. Because remember, folks, it's us. It's that 1%. Lowell, God bless you, my friend. Go ahead and close us off for the night. Goodbye, everybody. I will just uh, thank Dave for inviting me. Like I said, this is um, a different opportunity for me tonight. But the message that um, we'll put on the channel, um, I will do that immediately after this broadcast and get that listed up. So those of you that are on the channel, I'll take the time to go listen to it six minutes long, um, but get used to the nature of these messages. These things are being sent to Dave in a way that when I heard the mechanics of it, it's fascinating. And you can tell that at one of the seminars, because just how that packeted to us, we think of light packages. We discovered sound packages. And when you get to unwrap that little gift, that's just as amazing as light um, messages. Um, but my point is, there'll be more of these messages intended to be sent to Dave for everybody else. And so um, we will put these up as soon as we get them, because we know that they're time sensitive as well. So thank you for the opportunity to do in this. And thanks for everybody that showed up. Um, I love you. Send, send you all love and light. Thank you, Mo. Thank you.